Happy Father's Day to all of the fathers in the house. For those that may be watching online, God bless you. Happy Father's Day. And for those that are just here in attendance or may be watching online, I pray that you have been blessed by the worship and blessed by the praying thus far. I'm excited to continue our uh, series this week. We are back um, for the third installment of our Discovering Joy series. And I don't know about you, but this this series on joy has both encouraged and, and challenged me in ways that that I didn't anticipate or even really deem possible. Who knew that there would be so much to discover and and uncover about the wonders of joy. Y'all y'all heard my story before. I even started the series. I said, God, we've been going for four months now with some heavy hitting series, and I just it's summer. God, I need I need I need something light, I need some levity. God, I need something that's gonna inspire and encourage and have us walking out here feeling a bit lifted. And and who knew that there would be so much to to uncover and discover about the wonders of joy. I found myself, whether I was in conversation with my wife or just talking to the Holy Spirit, I found myself being more intentional about not allowing the circumstances of life to completely dispel or to drive out the joy that I have access to. Whether I'm talking to my wife or talking to the Holy Spirit, I'm like, man, we, we need to get our car fixed, man. There's some issues. There's some things going on. But joy. I have to find a perspective that allows me to to keep a handle on it or to keep my hand on the joy that we have access to. And what I've started to discover or what what I'm discovering as we work our way through this series, and maybe you have found yourselves um, here as well, but what I'm discovering and identifying through this series, and my prayer is, again, that, that, that you are as well as understanding and accepting that there is room for two things to happen simultaneously. There is room for two things to be true simultaneously. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean by that, Keenan? What do you mean by there? there's room for two things to be true simultaneously? Well, what I mean by that is that it's okay to acknowledge. It's okay to communicate that I am navigating through an incredibly difficult season of life. It's okay to admit that. It's okay to acknowledge the fact that I'm, that I'm navigating or traversing through an incredibly difficult season of life while simultaneously acknowledging that I, I still have access to the joy of God Almighty. That it's possible for two things to be simultaneously true. It's possible for me to, going through, to be going through some difficulty. And it's also possible for me to still, yet in the face of difficulty and and uncertainty, to still have access to the joy of God Almighty. What I'm learning as I navigate through this series, ultimately, is that there's there's room for both. That's what I'm discovering. That's what I'm I'm starting to uncover. And and please understand, church, that, that the intent of this series is not to brainwash you. The intent of this series is is not to convince you that every day of your life that you're walking under the umbrella of joy and that nothing in your life will ever have the proximity or or the dis, or the severity to disrupt the joy that you're walking in. I'm not trying to convince or or persuade you of that. And if I am, I apologize because that's not the case. I'm not trying to persuade you that you'll be under under this umbrella or hat of joy. And as long as you recognize that, then there's nothing in this world that can disrupt that. There's nothing in this world that may shake that. There's nothing in this world that may alter that from time to time. That's not what I'm saying. That's not the purpose, number one. And number two, it's not true. Because what I've started to realize as as I've grown older, what I've started to realize uh, as I just get older in life, is that life happens. Difficulty happens. Uncertainty will happen. Calamity, it, it happens. Pain is real. Disappointment and failure and grief are reality. 
The very reason why, why Jesus focuses on the foundation that we're to build our lives on in Matthew, the seventh chapter. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and 24, it says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who who built his house on the rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and, and great was its fall. The first thing we have to understand and and realize is that regardless of your foundation, as you start to read this passage of scripture, what, what you have to realize is that regardless of your foundation, whether it's rock or whether it's sand, we have to realize that the rain will descend. Jesus didn't make a a separation or differentiation between those who built their, their lives on rock and those who built their life on sand. In both passages of scripture, the same thing happens. The the rain will descend. Jesus says the floods, the floods will come. The, The winds will blow and the house is going to take a beating. Nowhere in that passage of scripture in Matthew, the seventh chapter, does Jesus, does Jesus change his language and say for those that, that, that builds their house on a rock, there will be no rain, there will be no flood, there will be no wind, there will be no beating. No, 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 that's not what Jesus says. No one is immune to the conditions of life. Why does Jesus say what he says in, in Matthew, the seventh chapter? It's, be, it's because he understands whether it's, it's now or it's later. Jesus understands whether it's anticipated or or unexpected. Jesus knows that torrential rain will fall on the lives of all of us at some point in time. He was very clear in in what he was saying, that the rain that, that, that impacts our vision. It makes it uncomfortable to, to see clearly. Have you ever been driving down the road and all of a sudden it starts to rain and now my visibility is shifted? And now I'm driving a little slower and the windshield wipers are going and I can't clearly see what's in front of me. Rain has the ability to to impact my vision. Rain makes it difficult to to take simple steps that I generally would have taken with no regard at all. Because now there's the possibility that that I may slip and fall. Now there's the possibility of injury and Jesus, Jesus is saying the rain will descend. Rain that shows the areas of my life where I got some leaks. Rain will show the areas of my life where where there's vulnerability. All it needs to do is rain hard enough and you'll start to see some spotting in the ceiling. And you'll see some areas where it starts to leak and it's, oh, I, I didn't know it was leaking over there. That's what rain will do. It'll show you some areas of your life that, that you need to patch up. It'll show you some areas of your life that you thought were good, but have left you vulnerable and exposed. Jesus understood that, that the floods and the winds will undoubtedly come. He, he didn't just stop with the rain, but he said the, the floods and the wind will undoubtedly come and that every area of your life will be tested. Jesus says there isn't a component or aspect of your life that will not feel the velocity of what life will throw your way. Jesus is intentional about using the the analogy of wind and waves because he understands that wind can't be seen. But it can be felt. And when it's strong enough, it can even be heard. And so Jesus is saying that there will come some times in our lives when we're caught off guard by what hits us because we never saw it coming. And that's what wind is. You, you cannot see it. And, and when it's close enough and when it's blowing hard enough, you can, you can feel it and you can hear it. But nobody can ever see it coming. And so Jesus is saying the rain is going to come and expose some areas of your life. It's going to show you some vulnerabilities and, and some areas where you need to patch some things up. But there's also going to be a wind that comes. 
And I don't care who you are, you, you won't be able to see this one coming. If you ever talk to a boxer, if you ever talk to somebody that has fought professionally, they'll all say the same thing. That the hardest punch to take is the one that you never saw coming. The hardest punch to take is, is the one that you never saw coming. Jesus says that the wind is going to blow. Yes, yes, I heard it as it got closer. Yes, I felt it as, as it drew near, but, but I never saw it coming. I heard Mama grimacing and, and holding her back and, and holding her abdomen from time to time, but, but I never saw the, di the cancer diagnosis coming. Never saw it coming. I heard the doctors explaining the severity of, of how it had spread from one major organ to another major organ, but I didn't see death coming. Jesus says the winds of life will come, and you, you'll hear it as it gets closer, and you'll, you'll fear it, and you'll start to brace, but, but you'll never see it coming. And I don't care if you've built your life on rock or on sand, the wind is coming, and the rain will descend. That isn't enough. Jesus says the winds will fall and, and the wind will the wave of the rain will fall and, and the winds will blow. But he also says that, that the waves are coming as well. If you've ever seen a boat or a vessel in the ocean during the middle of a storm, then you know the power that the ocean possesses. And the difference between the wind that I can see that I can't see in the waves that, that I can see is that I'm well aware of what I'm up against when I see the waves coming. I'm well aware of the height. I'm, I'm well aware of the severity. I'm well aware of, of the impact of what's, what's about to hit me. But even with all of that, I, I can see it coming. But all I can do is, is brace for the impact. Nothing I can do to stop it. All I can do is brace for the impact. No, 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 no. The, the intent of this series is, isn't to convince you that as long as you choose joy, then life won't happen. That, that is not the purpose of this series. I want to assure you and confirm and solidify the fact that life will happen to all of us. But that doesn't mean that there isn't enough room in my life for two things to be true. Okay to acknowledge that, that I'm navigating through an incredibly difficult season of my life while simultaneously acknowledging that I still have access to the joy of God Almighty in my heart. What does that even mean? What does that mean, Keenan? It, it sounds good, but, but what does that look like? How do I walk this thing out? Well, well it means that it's okay to admit that emotionally and financially and, and physically and, and spiritually and relationally that, that I'm struggling and I'm in a difficult season of life. It's okay to acknowledge and admit that, that financially and spiritually and, and mentally or emotionally or, or relationally or in any of those areas or, or a combination of those areas, it's, it's okay to acknowledge that I'm struggling and having a difficult time. One person. That means that their health isn't where, where they want or need it to be. For someone else, it's, it's their finances. It remains a constant point of frustration and tension in their life or in their marriage. And what I'm required to put out on a monthly basis is, is far larger than what I'm bringing in on, on a monthly basis. And so there's a tension there that I have between what I have coming in and what needs to go out. And so there's a struggle and there's a, a difficulty in my finances. Or for someone else, it seems like every time you finally get a good rhythm going, 
Every time you get a good battle rhythm going of studying and, and praying and worshiping and fasting, every time you get a good rhythm going and you're in sync with, with how you're reading and spending some intimate time in the presence of God, it seems like life deals you a blow that just shakes you to your core and disrupts your rhythm. So I had a spiritual rhythm going and I found myself in sync and I found myself in tune and in line with the word of God. I, I found myself clearly hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. I found my priorities starting to shift in. And as soon as I got on track, life dealt me a blow. Maybe, just maybe, you're still grieving the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've experienced failure and, and disappointments and, and setbacks recently that, that you didn't see coming. Maybe the totality, totality of what, what you've had to carry in this season has weighed on you heavily, emotionally. Maybe you're one of the ones that thought that you'd be farther along in life by now. Those that are closest to you are or appear to be flourishing. Those that you follow online are, are thriving and making major moves and solidifying deals and promoting and growing and, and going. But when you look at your life, you, you don't see yourself where you thought you would be by now. And the reality that you aren't where you hope to be. The reality that you aren't where you want to be. The reality where you think that, that you need to be right now because I'm, I'm getting older, God. And the older I get, it's drawing me closer and closer to death. And so I need to get some things in line, God, because there are some things that, that I want to accomplish. So you beat on yourself day after day, watching what you think are others thriving while you feel complacent and stagnant where you are. Or maybe you're like me. And depending on what day of the week it is, the correct answer might be all of the, all of the above. Maybe you're like me and it's not just one. Good for you if it's just one. But there's some sitting here today that are saying, yep, yep, yep to multiple boxes, and, I, and I, can, I can identify with all of these at the same time because I'm still wrestling, I'm still wrestling with the grief of loss. I'm still wrestling with the grief of, of losing my mama. I'm, I dealt with some physical pain recently that, that had me struggling far more emotionally and, and spiritually than it did even physically. Finances are fluctuating, kids are getting older, and tuition is costing more, and more things are needed on a monthly basis, and relationships that I thought I always have are, have become fractured, and, and I thought I'd be farther along in life by now in some areas, and, and I'm not really there yet, and when I start to think about it all, what I've come to realize is that through this series, is that all of the above can be true. Yes, I'm still grieving. Yes, I thought I'd be farther along in some areas. Yes, there are times when finances are a struggle. Yes, there are some relationships that I have that are fractured. Yes, they're all true right now. And it still doesn't negate the fact that I've got access to the joy of the Lord. The fact that I can check Multiple boxes doesn't negate the fact that I still have access to the joy of the Lord. But I now understand as we navigate through this series, what, what, what has come to the realization is that perfection in life, perfection in life and, and the joy of the Lord do not go hand in hand. Perfection in life and the joy of the Lord do not go hand in hand. Perfection and joy don't run parallel. They don't run parallel. Perfection in my life and the joy of the Lord don't run parallel. It's the very reason 
Why the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 2, that for the joy that was set before him. It's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 2 that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning shame. And now he's seated on the right hand side of the father that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Don't you for one second think that the cross was a cakewalk? Don't you for one second think that life has to be perfect in order for me to experience the joy of the Lord? Because the cross wasn't a cakewalk. Calvary wasn't some easy road to walk. The the cross was bloody. The cross was gory. The the cross was gruesome. The lashes were real. The pain was was real. The the pain was, was evident. The weight physically and spiritually and emotionally was all but in, insurmountable. But even if I look at and I study the life of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 12 and 2 lets me know that while he had to endure pain and he got to the point where he said, Father, if there is any other way than this, then, then give me that option. If there's any other cup that I, that I could drink than this cup of suffering, God, give me that cup because this almost seems like it's too much to bear. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What that, what that does is it lets me know that joy was still an option. That as difficult as the assignment was, joy was still an option. That both can ring true at the very same time. That, God, I've got a difficult road I've got to walk. God, there's some pain that I'm going to have to endure. There, there's some uncertainty that I'm going to have to deal with. I'm going to be mocked and I'm going to be ridiculed and, and I'm going to be beaten. But for the joy that was set before me. And if Jesus can exemplify that, then I know that, that I can walk through it as well by the power of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus could do it, so could I. Not in my own strength. Not in the strength of Kenan. Not in the wisdom of man. But no, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I can understand that there's going to be some waves and some winds and some waves and some uncertainty and some floods that come my way. I've still got access to joy. So that's why That's why I can have pain in my body. That's why I can have pain riddle my body. But still choose joy. That's why my finances can be in shambles. And I still choose joy. That's why I can feel as though I've hit rock bottom. I can feel like there's no way to go. There's nowhere to go. There's, there's nowhere to turn. I can feel like my relationship or my marriage is, is on the brink. That's why I can look at life in this way and still realize that, that joy is still an option. That in the midst of it all, I can still choose joy. And please know that this isn't, this isn't some green light to just say that, that I'm going to go live any old raggedy kind of way and, and misuse what God has placed in my hands and just say that I choose joy. That's not what I'm saying here, but, but when, I've, when I've done all that I can, please understand that there's still accountability. There's still responsibility. There's still liability. So I don't just get to go and run through my finances and say, I I choose joy. No, no, no. God still will question you for what you've done with what he's placed in your hands. What did you do with what I've given you? I just can't go and ruin and mess over my marriage and be like, I still choose joy. No, 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 no. He's a covenant-keeping God. But what it does mean is that when, when I've done all that I know to do, and the circumstances of life start, start to rock me when the waves of life and the winds of life and the floods of life start to shake me and, and they start to rock me and rock me to my core. I still I, the, I have the option to choose joy. That's when I have the option to choose joy. Because what I understand and what I realize is that the character of the Holy Spirit doesn't change based off of my circumstances. 
the characteristics and the genetic makeup of the Holy Spirit does not change based off of the circumstances of Kenan. The Bible tells me in Galatians 5 that fruit of the Spirit is joy. And if I'm a blood-washed, born-again believer that has the Spirit of the living God dwelling on the inside of me, then, then joy is always an option. And I don't have to reject or deny what's happening over here to still choose joy. I don't have to say that marriage is difficult right now to still choose joy. I don't have to say that there's no pain and I don't have to deny reality to still choose joy. But in the midst of the giants that I have to face, I can still choose joy. Some of us have been missing out on the authentic and heavenly joy that we have access to because we've been waiting for earthly perfection. And if you're waiting on earthly perfection before you tap into the joy that we have access to, then I can absolutely guarantee you that you're going to miss it. If you're waiting for the perfect job and the perfect husband, and the perfect home, in the perfect neighborhood, with the perfect car, with the perfect income, with the perfect church, with the perfect pastor, with the perfect children, before you decide to choose joy, then you are going to miss it. You are going to die absent of joy. And the truth is that you don't have to. That with as messed up as my life may be for somebody, I can still choose joy. I can still walk in joy. And that's the conundrum of the Spirit of God is that even though life doesn't, doesn't appear to be perfect, I can walk around because the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's not my joy to tap into. It's not my strength to walk in. So whoever that sits with, God says, if you're waiting for perfection, You'll die and never experience the authentic, heavenly joy that he has waiting for you. That is literally dwelling on the inside of you now. God says you're missing it because it doesn't measure up right now. The income doesn't measure up right now. The, the circumstances, the totality of, of life doesn't measure up. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait to go over there until I get things right over here. And you'll be on your deathbed before you realize that I could have walked this thing out a whole lot differently. If I just chose joy. Because what I realized is that I wouldn't need God to be a fortress if perfection was a possibility. I wouldn't need God to be a fortress if perfection was a possibility. But joy is always, joy is always accessible under the shadow of the Almighty. Joy is always accessible under the shadow of the Almighty. For the next few minutes, and I do mean just a few minutes, because we've got some good dinner waiting at home that I'm looking forward to. But for the next few minutes, I want to shift your focus to the book of Proverbs, the 17th chapter. And before we put the scripture up on the screen and read it, I've got a, I've got a rhetorical question for you. One that you don't need to answer out loud, but a rhetorical question. Have you ever found yourself somber or in a gloomy mood? One of those moods where you felt heavy and you felt lethargic and you fit, didn't feel like doing much. And whether you could put your finger on what it was or, or not, have you ever just had... One of those moods where you just feel heavy and moody and you may be a bit sad or depressed or even a little bit melancholy. Have you ever, have you ever been in one of those moods? Show of hands. Have you ever had one of those days where you just felt heavy? But then out of nowhere, 
out of nowhere, didn't expect it, didn't anticipate it, didn't, didn't plan it. But out of nowhere, you read something or you heard something or you saw something that causes you to laugh so hard. That causes you to laugh so carefree that by the time you finish laughing, you feel better, even though the circumstances of your life haven't changed. That, man, I was feeling heavy. I was feeling bogged down. I was feeling weighed down. And, and some days I know what it is. And other days I, I can't even quite put my hand on it. But I'm scrolling on it, social media or I see something on TV or somebody says something. And it says it just is so funny that I laugh so hard that by the time I finish laughing, I feel a little bit lighter. Whatever I was feeling is feels a little bit lighter. The diagnosis is still the same. The doctor's report is still the same. The account is still negative and, and overdrawn. The divorce papers are, are still filed. The children still aren't listening. The home still seems chaotic. But, man, that laugh just, just made me feel a little better. The world has an old adage that says laughter is the best medicine. The world has an old adage that says that laughter is the best medicine. But I've lived, I've lived long enough to know that the world can only offer me a replica. I've lived long enough to realize that the world can only, off, only offer me an, an imitation of the real thing. The world can never offer me the authentic thing. Laughter, laughter is absolutely good for the soul. Don't, don't get me wrong. Laughter, laughter is phenomenal. I love, I love to laugh. And the benefits of laughing are, are incredible. Laughter, it increases your intake of oxygen-rich air. Laughter is good for you. It increases your, your intake of oxygen-rich air. It stimulates your heart and your lung and other muscles. Laughter increases the endorphins that are, that are released from your brain. And so laughter has some absolutely positive benefits. The benefits of laughter are great. The only problem is that laughter is the best medicine. If, if laughter is the best medicine, then I'm constantly searching for the next funny moment. Vulnerability. Did I hear that, Luke? If laughter is indeed the best medicine, then that means that I'm constantly in search of the next funny moment, of the next thing that's going to tickle me, of the next thing that's going to make me laugh so hard that I forget about what I'm going through. If laughter is indeed the best medicine. But what I've noticed and what you've probably noticed as, world, as well is that the problem with the world is that the world will never point you to Jesus. I don't care what's happening. I don't care what's going on in the world. The world will never point you to Jesus. Jesus says in John 15 and 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. The world will never point you to Jesus, ever. It'll offer you a version of Jesus. The world will offer you a distorted and, and perverted version of Jesus. The world may offer you a dumbed-down version of, of something that looks like it could be potentially Jesus. But the world will never offer you Jesus. And so the world will take something like Treat others as you want to be treated and call it the golden rule when we as believers know in Luke 6 and, and 31 that the Bible says do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Which sounds good. It has some great benefits, but it doesn't point me to Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn quickly to Proverbs, the 17th chapter. And the 22nd verse. Proverbs 17 and 22. And if you were here last week, we did a ton of reading last week. But this week, I simply want to focus on one verse. 
And the Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 22 that a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Proverbs 17, 22 says a joyful heart is good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries up bones. And I thought about it as I was reading this scripture and thinking about the adage that laughter is the best medicine. Because on the surface, it sounds like what the world is saying and what God is saying is the same thing. It can sound like they're saying the same thing. And, and if we aren't careful, we'll start to adopt the language of the world because we aren't discerning what the, the subtle ways in which the world is actually trying to have us pursue everything but Jesus. If we aren't discerning of what the world is saying and we just start to adopt and to onboard the language of the world, we will not see and recognize the subtle ways in which the world is just trying to slowly pivot. Pivot. Well, laughter is good. Laughter does have great benefits, so it is the best medicine. And we'll start to adopt this language, and slowly what the world is doing is drawing us away and just further and further away from Jesus. The world says laughter is the best medicine. The word of God says a joyful heart is good medicine. Sounds similar. But what's the difference? Laughter is temporary. Joy is eternal. Laughter is temporary. If, I, if laughter is the best medicine, then, then I only feel good with the next laughter. And I'm constantly looking for the next high, and I'm constantly looking for the next funny, and I'm constantly looking for the next joy, because, next joke, because I, I need laughter to keep me medicated. Laughter is temporary. Is it good for a moment? Absolutely. But joy is eternal. Laughter can become a coping mechanism. I've seen people laugh so that they didn't have to deal with what they were going through. Whereas joy is a choice. Joy says, I see everything that I'm going through and I, and I still choose joy. Joy isn't a coping mechanism. Joy says, in spite of my circumstances, I still choose to tap into the joy that I have access to. But I've seen people at work and in my family who are funny beyond measure. And you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and their lives are broken. And they hate life. And everybody can laugh with them because they're extremely funny. And they go home and they cry themselves to sleep at night. Laughter can become a coping mechanism. While joy is a choice. Laughter will have you seeking fulfill fulfillment in comedy. Whereas joy will have you seeking fulfillment in Christ. Laughter takes strength. It takes Take strength to laugh. Have you ever laughed so hard that my stomach hurts? My, I've laughed so hard that I'm just drained. Joy gives strength. One takes. The other gives. Laughter points to man. Whereas joy points to Jesus. Three quick points, and I'm not even going to dive into them. But three quick points that I want to make about joy. About a joyful heart being good medicine. And then I'll take my seat. Point number one is this. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and 23 that above all else, guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, above all else, guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. Proverbs 17 and 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine. And so what my Bible is telling me is that whatever I've got seated in my heart, 
is going to flow through my life. Whatever I have seated in my heart will flow through my life. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and 23 that out of your heart flows the issues of life. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. And so if I have a joyful heart, then the same way that I can take medicine and as it enters into my bloodstream, it's affecting every area of my life. Any pain that I have, it's reaching the pain. And the Bible says it's the same thing with joy, that if I choose joy, if I, if I have a joyful heart, then I'll see it begin to infiltrate every area of my life. In areas where I've had no joy, areas where I've had no peace, area where I've been discouraged and, I, and I've failed and I've been disappointed, the Bible says if I just have a joyful heart, that it's like good medicine for my soul. That if I just take it, if I, if I just have a good heart, I'll, I'll see it begin to make its way through every area of my life. Am I saying that every circumstance you have will change? Nope, but your perspective and your outlook will. Nope, but the way that I approach that thing will. And that job that I've hated waking up to go to, I'll, I'll now wake up with some joy. And although I still may not like going, there's a joy that I have now. Still hate what I'm doing. Still hate going to the place. But there's a joy that I have now. And over time, it'll begin to change your perspective and your outlook. What's changed? Has the job changed? Nope. Has the job description changed? Nope. Has the manager changed? Nope. But my perspective has because my heart has. That's what the Bible is saying. And if I've got a joyful heart, it's like good medicine. In areas where I've had to endure pain, no longer needs to be a point of pain. No longer needs to be a point of tension. Point number two, and what I love about this one, the Bible says a joyful heart is, is good medicine. And what I wrote down is this, is that the Bible doesn't specify who the medicine is good for. The Bible doesn't specify who the medicine is good for. And what I thought is maybe, maybe just maybe your joy is, is the catalyst for somebody else's joy. Maybe your joy, your joyful heart is the catalyst for somebody else on your job receiving salvation. Maybe I need to get some joy in my heart so I can show up to that job with a good heart because there's somebody that God is trying to reach. And if I don't get my heart in check, then God will never be able to reach them. And so maybe that good medicine that the Bible is talking about just isn't for me. Maybe just maybe my community might, might be impacted by my joyful heart. Maybe there's some medicine, maybe there's some pain points and, and some relationships that I'm not even aware of that, that will be affected by the joyful heart that I have. The Bible doesn't specify who the medicine is good for or the effects of the medicine or how far reaching what the, what the ripple effect is of taking this medicine. You know, you take medicine now or you see a commercial and it says, take this medicine and it's good for blood pressure. But the side effects are diarrhea, constipation, upset stomach, and potentially death. And I'm better off with my disease than I am with your drugs. But the side effects of a joyful heart are far-reaching. I don't even have the ability to understand what God is going to do. If I just decide tonight, God, I'm going to wor work on it. And I'm going to subject myself to the Holy Spirit because I need a joyful heart. God, I, I need the type of medicine you're talking about in Proverbs. I don't get to decide the ripple effect of that. How that impacts my children. How it impacts my home and my perspective on finances and the way that I show up in the world. Point number three. The Bible says a joyful heart is good medicine. Your prescription never runs out. Your 
prescription never runs out. I was dealing with a pinched nerve in my neck, and they gave me some naloxicam and some gabapentin, and I was taking them, and I was supposed to start taking more and more to increase the dosage, and before I knew it, I was out. And I was just left to deal with the pain. But what I love about the joy of the Lord is it's an endless supply of it. That as often as I wake up and choose joy, it's there. As often as I decide, God, I want to live under the shadow of the Almighty. God, I want you to be my fortress and, and my refuge. God, I, I choose joy. God, give me the medicine that, that never runs out. God, I don't know what you're doing and who you're trying to use me to impact or who you're trying to use me to influence. So, so God, I need the joy of the Lord. And I never have to worry about being under the shadow of the Almighty and running out. Because there's an endless supply of joy. So with that, I close, but I want you to realize that there's room for two things to be simultaneously true. That I could be dealing with some calamity and some uncertainty. I could still be wrestling with some grief of a loss. I could still be struggling with parenthood or with marriage or with my job or with dealing with relationships that have been fractured. That can all still be true and still have access to the joy of the Lord. And if you're waiting for both or if you're waiting for perfection over here before you tap into the joy over here. That's exactly where the enemy wants you because it's a carrot that he'll dangle. And I've been there. Boy, when I make this amount of money, I'm solid. House will be on point. Car will be on point, And I've surpassed that 10 times over. And life still happens. Pain still comes. Mama still passed. Struggle still exists. Relationships still fractured. And the enemy wants us to think nothing more that when you get this, when you just get, when you move here, when you get this ring, when the marriage comes, when the baby comes, when this comes, it'll all be perfect. No, it won't. But joy is still available. Now just imagine how many buckets of joy are in heaven that have never been tapped into. Because somebody was waiting for perfection on earth before they accessed the joy in heaven. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. God, I thank you for your loving kindness and for your tender mercies. I thank you, God, because through the enlightenment and power of your Holy Spirit, you bring clarity to your word. You allow for discernment. You allow for truth. You allow us to see through the lies and deceit of the enemy. And no longer, God, do we have to chase after the fool's gold of the world. No longer have to we, do we have to believe in the imitation and the fallacy of what the world has to offer. When your word declares that in your presence there is fullness of joy. When your word declares that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Your word declares that a joyful heart is good medicine. And I, I know that some of us have been living with sickness. joy was intended to deal with and we've chased after stuff and we've chased after people and we've chased after traveling and locations and relationships and finances and positions and status and cars and this and that and there's some areas of our lives that remain sick 
There's some areas of our lives that remain vulnerable and exposed. There's some areas of our lives that are deteriorating. God says, I, I've got the antidote. I've got the medicine. I've got what you need, and it's just joy. But you can choose now. It's not even your joy. Don't, don't worry about trying to conjure it up on your own. I, I've got the joy. areas of your life that are weak and feeble and broken. God says, my joy is your strength. My joy is your strength. So God, we thank you for the access. Holy Spirit, we thank you for dwelling in us. We thank you because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. God, and tonight we choose joy. We thank you for laughter, but we choose joy. Because it's eternal. And it points us to Jesus. Whatever you're doing in our hearts and our minds, continue to do it now. According to your will and your word, I thank you for the seed that has been planted during this series. And the reminder tonight that, God, it is possible for two things to, to be true simultaneously, that I can be dealing with some significant issues in my life and still walk in the joy of the Lord. Thank you for the truth of your word. peace that comes as a result of your word. If you find yourself in the room this evening and just saying, oh, it's a joy I haven't experienced, but it's a joy I want to walk. Find yourself in need of prayer this evening. For the next few minutes, I just want to open it up for prayer. You say, I've been trying to figure this thing out on my own. There are some areas of my life that I know are sick. There are some areas of my life that I know are vulnerable. And I've been trying to use laughter to cover it up, but there's some pain that I'm dealing with. I invite you down to the altar. You've felt like you've had to live a life so hard because of some of the experiences that you've had to deal with. And you want to walk in the ease of joy. I invite you down to the altar. you've convinced yourself that life is just hard. Life is just difficult and this is just, it is what it is. And I've just got to buckle up and muster through it. God says, I have joy for you. And whether you're sitting in your seat or you're watching online, ask is that you would just begin to pray. And if you're like, man, I'm good. I got it. I, I got it. I got the joy of the Lord. There's somebody you know that needs it. And we will be a church that intercedes on the behalf of others. We will be a church that stands in the gap. And if you've got joy, then great. Pray for somebody who doesn't. Begin to intercede for somebody who needs it. who you want to experience the glorious goodness and the joy of the Lord. Because you know what it's done for you. You 
know how it's affected you. You know how it's allowed you to continue on. ask you to pray that as a body and as a family we can pray over your children over your marriage over fractured relationships over those that don't know Jesus oh there's much to pray about Oh, there's much to pray about. There's a city. There's a state. There's a nation. There's a world that's in need of a savior. And I challenge you right now to push past whatever you're feeling. To pray on the behalf of somebody else. And watch God move. 